moved from Indiana to Illinois, basically. And uh, I called up and I saw that the RFP was just had gone past due, and they were taking the more application for the, the, you know, the submission date and passed. And I was kind of upset about it because I thought, you know, serious, here we are, we're part of the innovation center, we're really, we're, we're really a perfect fit for this organization and for this project. And uh, so I tried to call in, and of course John would talk to me, go uh, to the staff, and you know, they said, well, we're not taking more applications, we appreciate it, you know, and uh, so I couldn't get a hold of them, so I decided to go to one of their fundraising events, which of course, you know, he was at. And I pinned him down and said, hey, you know, I really think that we should have a shot at this opportunity if you haven't selected somebody yet because I think our organization is a really good fit. We're local. And uh, the economic development the group they were with, you know, they started getting the proposals and they thought, well, you know, there's no one that really is screaming out to us that they're a great fit. So he said, why don't you go ahead and send me a, a proposal and we'll take a look at it and you may end up opening things back up. And they ended up opening them back up and selecting us and uh, we've had a great uh, ongoing relationship with our sons. That was kind of our start into a lot of our economic business, which we've done a lot of on, on a national level. So we've been uh, a partner with the Northeast Indiana uh, Regional Partnership for quite a while. And I think they play uh, a pivotal role in really helping our region grow nationally. And they've done an amazing job of really putting a voice to Northeast Indiana uh, out there in the world. And they're, they're whether you know it or not, they're pushing us out there to the entire globe, and I think they're, they're doing some really important work. So we're just, it's an honor to have John here to speak to us today, and so, uh, John Farn, up and speak. Thanks, man. Everybody be okay if I uh, did not use the microphone? If I don't tie myself that every if you're okay. Um, actually, Hey, we really uh, appreciate the, uh, the uh, introduction by Matt um, because it's very telling about Matt and what Sears has become. Um, if, if nothing else, Matt is very persistent. <laughs> and uh, I tried to say no several times to Matt that the window had been closed and he wasn't going to take it, so I thought it was better to, to accept the proposal than to fight Matt on because Matt is just that persistent in, in a good way. So um, it's been a really great relationship. I, it turns out only much after the fact that I discover that I actually met Matt once before when he was at the, um, the first Innovation Center location, which was in the back empty offices of Raytheon. And uh, they were fixing this area up, and Matt was one of the, I think, not the first, the first, the first, uh, the first tenant in that building. And when I was First, fortunate enough to come to North Indiana and get to work, to work here. They said, You need to see the neck. And we went over the neck and we're wandering around and they were just getting things started. And there was one person in the neck. <laughs> and it was Matt sitting at a desk. So he's come a long way since then, and happily so. Um, and also, uh, pleased to see Mark Wickersham here. I don't know that you've done introductions, but Mark is the economic development professional from Huntington County. And uh, we work very closely, and they are member partners with the partnership, uh, one of the 10 counties that we serve. And so glad to have Mark here. And Mark, let me just start out by inviting you, if I miss a perspective or, you know, leave a gap in understanding, I want you to jump in. Just keep hearing the food. So, uh, first thing is, uh, uh, a couple test questions here. How many of you, and I know that there's probably a range here, but how many of you consider yourself small to mid-sized companies? And so looking around the room, maybe 90% of the people in the room are small to mid-sized companies, right? And how many of you are dependent um, on revenue generated inside this region? How many of you are, are dependent on revenue generated inside the region? And how many of you are perhaps, we'll say, more dependent on gen revenue generated from outside the region? Outside the region? So more from inside than outside, right? That helps me characterize what the group is. More from outside than inside, right? 
Okay, so the most of most of, most of you are generating most of your revenue from inside the region. So I'm going to assume by that that you care about the health of the economy in Northeast Indiana. Fair assumption. This is the this is the audience uh, participation part. You know. Uh, yes. 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 Yeah. Okay. So you're all deeply invested because you're responsible or work with small and medium-sized companies who are invested in the success of our economy in the region. So that's a safe assumption. There are companies, you know, as we all know, that are located here in the region who are not that dependent on the health of the region's economy, but I would say that they are committed to the health of the community in the region's economy because they're located here. And they bring people here, they try to find talent here, uh, to the extent that they can find people to do the kind of work they're doing on a national and international scale. They are concerned about the health and well-being of the community and doing work in this community. This is a place they may call their headquarters. This may they may call their home. Um, so, in a, perhaps a less direct way than many of you in this room, they are committed to the health and well-being of the community in Northeast Indiana. So, so far so good. I'm trying to characterize what we're going to talk about. All this leads to. Um, Derek pressed me and pressed me and pressed me about what are you going to talk about, John? Can you, we, we need a title, right? So he, I, he wouldn't hang up until I got a title. So <laughs> he came up with the collaboration of the region's economy. And I just wanted to establish this foundation piece that many of you are deeply invested in the success of this economy in the region by operating a small and medium-sized company. You're perhaps in a supplier network. Uh, you're a vendor of services or a vendor of direct product to other companies doing business in the region, right? So that's a, a good starting point. Or you may be uh, doing work, building things, that kind of a thing. And all that depends on the growth of this economy. So here we go. I laid this hand up on your desk and table with a graph that is somewhat representative. This doesn't tell the whole story, but this plots over the last 30 to 40 years the per capita income, per person income in this region over the last 30 to 40 years. It's been steadily declining, perhaps even more vigorously over the last 15 years. We've lost 15% against the national average <coughs> per capita income over the last 15 years. So over the last year, we've lost almost a percent and a half. Even, you know, very, di very difficult economic times, but we have lost a percent and a half over the last year. And by that data there, I would submit that that's what we have to look forward to this next year. Thoughts or reactions of that and your ability to operate, start up, a new enterprise, an entrepreneurial activity, grow the base of clients, not if Cirrus has gone national, you have a number of clients not in this region anymore, statewide and national. What, what, pro, what does this say to you? What, is this, what are your thoughts when you understand the significance of that curve to you on a personal level? This is more audience part. I don't have any answer to this correct. This, this is your answer, not my answer. We need to do something. We need to act. We need to act. Writing these down. I think we have to get out of the bubble because we're not limited anymore by local business. We can go out to on a global level if we want to. Okay, so I can write go global. Yeah. Other thoughts about that? I mean, is, is it is it of concern to you? Of course. How many of you were aware of this before you came in the room? I know some of you are. Some of you are very familiar with this. We are trying to spread this word universally to support that we need to act. We need to act. Other thoughts on this? Reactions to this? No, business thinking it's, it's hard to get people to spend money when they're losing money. Are you a direct, do you supply consumers direct? 
Wait, do you mind me asking what you do? Um, the aluminum T-slot framing. Sorry? Aluminum T-slot framing. Okay, aluminum T-slot framing. Do you sell direct to consumers most inside the region? Hard to get people to buy. Other thoughts or reactions? Sir? Yeah. So that part of the form to like manufacturing practices when they're outside of the government or anything that, that wants to conform to different formulas. Government intervention and regulation is not always helpful. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. So maybe creativity on how to I won't, go in, I won't go too far down this path, but how many of you care what the federal government's doing with the national economy? <laughs> <laughs> or not. Or <laughs> not doing it. Or not doing it, right? <laughs> government regulation certainly matters. John, I think we need a fundamental change in our thought process on a political level and on an educational level to change the mindset that manufacturing is something the country no longer does. We need to focus on manufacturing growth. I mean, how many of the folks here realize that Indiana is the largest manufacturing state in the Union? How many people realize that the northern part of Indiana has more manufacturing than just about any other state in the Union? That most of the manufacturing jobs in this country are in northern Indiana and northern Ohio? And they have a huge impact on our economy. And they're dwindling because of a lack of focus, education. You know, Ivy Tech, you know, it's got some new programs for starting up um, the old, entre not entrepreneur, but the apprentice programs to train people to actually do stuff. I mean, we've got a, a skill set. I mean, I hire, uh, I'm very blessed to have 32 people on staff now. And it's a struggle getting people coming out of university that are qualified to do the job. And I do a lot of consulting work with manufacturing companies, and I see all the time how they are struggling with talent. They cannot find qualified people. I mean, I know Nick can speak to this. He's working with... Uh, We've lost significant uh, emphasis on vocational train, training, education, and stuff like that. We've put so much focus in, uh, in uh, technology areas that we've, uh, we don't train people anymore for the fundamental businesses that we do here in Northeast Indiana. You, so what I hear you saying is you get the talent wherever you can find it regardless of where the location is? Better be ready to train them and put the investment into them and tell them okay. focus is not in the community. Mm -hmm. Nick, tell them about what you're doing with Ivy Tech. Um, I was, my business is Rossmore Transmission here in Fort Wayne and um, for about the last 12 years now we have two apprentice programs modeled around the similar type of apprenticeships that have been around in journeyman, electrician, plumber type trades and stuff for, for decades. And um, we take uh, students right out of the high school level while they're still in high school. And um, they do a work share program, a co-op kind of program. <coughs> if they graduate that, we, uh, <coughs> we have a partnership with Ivy Tech where they take their associate's degree in um, automotive technology a three to four year program and um, if they graduate then we pay for 100% of the schooling. Um, I've got a highly trained technician who has been, uh, been trained on the job as well as uh, had the, the academic training that they so, um, The best program I've ever, I've ever had for developing a talent. It's, you know, not, uh, Okay, this, you all feed me information for this discussion because this story gets played out repeatedly. Um, I met with a manufacturer from uh, Steuben County um, earlier this week, and uh, his number one challenge was talent, finding the right people, and he, and I didn't, you said it differently, but he's saying precisely the same thing. He says, we don't even care if they have the skill anymore. If they have the right attitude, he says, we're prepared to train them ourselves. He says, we only accept one out of 50, one out of 50 applicants. Uh, I've had this conversation with Scott Glaze of Fort Wayne Metals. 
think their number is like one out of a hundred. You know, in either case, it's big, right? You have to interview a lot of people to find the right character qualities of that individual, and then determine whether you can train them. To do what I prefer they don't come to me with skills, because typically I have to undo half of what they've been trained. <laughs> <laughs> to going into the high school and plucking them at that age. So, with, with that as background, and, and, <coughs> is there anything else you put on this? I didn't even ask this question, but the question is, what is your chief challenge in terms of operating this business? Now, we talked about, we talked a little bit about the decline in per capita income in the region, and how that is not a good message. Now, think of this, you're thinking about this from a business perspective, but think of Europe, operating a foundation, or a not-for-profit. Um, if you're an educational unit, higher ed, or K through 12, and you're based, you know, you've got uh, some income stream from taxes, uh, or you're trying to draw new students in, so forth, the, the message is still the same, right? There isn't anybody, even if you're a government unit and could tax the heck out of people, this does not bode well for us as a region. And, the regional partnership, and I'm going to give you a little background if, if you'll allow me. Uh, the regional partnership, we came into this knowing this was going on only five years ago. And because of this, we have changed our mission as a, as a partnership. And Mark knows, um, Mark Richardson knows what we are going through to transform the partnership to be responsive to this. Um, and I would submit to you that if you are doing business in Northeast Indiana, whether you're deriving revenue from here or elsewhere, this is the common enemy. This is what pulls us together as a community. I'm very concerned about, and I apologize, I think it's your name. I'm Nick. Nick, hey. I'm very concerned about Nick and others who have the same story told in different words about their ability to find the talent required to do <coughs> the work in this region, because I believe that that is the deciding factor for the growth of companies is the ability to find work. There was a day, um, and I've, some of you may have heard me say this before, but my wife and I are at our address, home address number 17. Now, part of that I blame on the Navy, so I, I get off the hook for some of that. But we're on address number 17 because in our day and age, I clearly, you know, we had this discussion at a family level that if I had to move to provide for my family, we would move. And that was, um, that was uncomfortable. Well, I remember that twice I had to tell my mom we were moving from Washington State to Michigan. And both times she cried. Okay. So I did it more than once. But the point was, I was in an age, a uh, generation, that we, if work moved, we would move with the work to provide for our families. Now, young people, and you all may, uh, many of you are much more adept at this than I am, but. People are deciding where they want to work or where they want to live, and then they're adapting the lifestyles or trying to find work to adopt to where they want to live. It's much more a locational preference where people want to be, and then they adapt their work life to accommodate that. This is entirely different dynamics than when I was growing up and perhaps what you experienced as a young person. This One thing, you know, I think is an awareness of, I think more now than ever before, um, is the generational differences right, between the baby boomers and the generation X and then the generation Y. Right. There, there are three distinct thought process difference of that, such as you said on the, uh, you know, a lot of the uh, generation Y and younger are, if the world is what it is, I can go where the weather's nice <laughs> and I can go live there, right, and I'll make happen whatever I need to to provide, like, you know, right. just your example. That's right. different than the way other people would think. Right. right. So. Yep. And the, and, the, and the very workforce that we're expecting to replace our aging workforce, many of us are thinking about retirement, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, they think entirely different. You know, we're, we're, we're thinking we're setting up attractive situations where we come to work, and they're much more skeptical about the conditions under which they're willing to work. They, they require much more freedom. <coughs> much more options, flexibility in the workplace than, than we require. I, you know, eight to five, you know, I worked rotating shift work for many years. You know, that was just what I had to do to provide for my family. Things are different today. So, this, just want to conclude this part, is just saying that 
In terms of introduction, I'm proposing this is a common enemy for starting up a new corporation, uh, whether you want to expand your business, whether you want to grow your business, and, I, and now I'm going to give you a little background on the regional partnership on why we're talking, why um, Matt and Derek were so good to invite me to speak with you today. I am simply spreading the message um, to increase people's understanding of what the regional partnership is doing on your behalf, whether you know or are connected with our work or not. You're all welcome to be in one form or another. The partnership was started up in 2006 formally uh, for a, with a single narrow focus, and that was to generate what we refer to are as project leads. This region, um, there are three basic components to economic development, growing the economy in the region. One is to keep you as a business. We want to retain you in the region. We would like you to expand. And we need to attract new. And when the partnership was started up, these three activities were being done in every single community in the region, city or county, and they were being done on a competitive basis. So Allen County and Huntington, Allen County and Whitley, Huntington and Whitley, Wells County and Whitley County, Steuben County, all these organizations were looking at economic development in a jurisdictional sense. They were hiring economic development professionals to do attraction work, retention work, and business expansion. And that model went away about 10 years ago because of the way the region's economy works. Much more so today, I mean, just some of the changes you've talked about, commuting patterns, about 10% of the population, the working population in our region commute to another county to do work from which they live. How many of you do that? How many in this room do that? How many in this room? Two, three, four of you? Okay, so about 10% of this room, in exact representation, you may drive from one county to another to do work. And that's the way the economy works. I don't think that you could care less where that car came from as long as they end up in your shop and you're doing the work on that sh shop, right? In theory. In theory. <laughs> in theory. Um, and when the, regions, when, the, when the global economy started, when we started having a global economy and people started doing work and doing marketing on a global scale, people realized that the economy was working on a regional basis. Um, this became more and more difficult, attracting new. It's very expensive. You have to commit to it over the long term, this attraction activity. To create a project lead, to bring in a new business, to take services and bring residents to this region became much more difficult and more expensive. And the proposition of the partnership was let's do that on a regional basis. So we have one organization that acts as a single point of contact for the region so that people can find us easier, they know what we're about, we represent the aggregate resources of the region, um, we represent the assets of Huntington County compared to Allen County, we represent them in total as an opportunity to create a new business. So we were a marketing organization for the region for economic development purposes, and our job day in and day out was to create project leads. We started that in 2006, really in 2007 when we put the infrastructure in place we did that for about a year and a half. We got to mid-2008, and we discovered, we discovered that the product that we were offering on a global scale to attract new business leads was not competitive. The product that we were offering, offering as an economic development region was not competitive. Is anybody offended by that remark? <laughs> Not all regions in the country are suffering this. A lot of communities in the Midwest are suffering this, but not all regions of the country are suffering this decline. The, I'll tell you, the founders of the partnership thought if we just hung out our shingle, glossed it up a little bit, changed the font, increased the font size, got the right colors right, that the world would flock to Northeast Indiana because we were, we are, the highest concentration of manufacturing expertise in the country is in this region. No questions about it. The highest concentration of manufacturing expertise exists, resides, is resident in this region. 
And we honestly thought if we just hung up the shingle, we set up a website, we hired a really expensive firm, Cirrus ABS. <laughs> <laughs> but they were also very good. Um, and that is our number one marketing tool is operating a, a world-class website. Um, and you can visit our website at uh, choosenendiana.com. Um, and what you see is not a lot of quality of life stuff, but a lot of business case information, data, demographics, sites, buildings, <clears throat> representing, again, all 10 counties. If you wanted to come to our website and search the Huntington website, Huntington County, because you knew you wanted to be in that particular part of the region, you know, we are a uh, conduit for that. At the end of the day, the regional partnership was never designed to close a deal. We were a lead generator. At the end of the day, we turn over project leads to Mark and 10 other county, nine other county, economic developers, and the, our value proposition was that we could do it much more cost effectively on a regional basis than have every single community competing neck and neck, eye to eye, toe to toe, trying to build the infrastructure, operate that website, do all the things that a community has to do. <coughs> we were just saying you can do that better if we do that together on a regional basis and that required collaboration. <coughs> Thoughts or questions about that? That was the focus of the partnership in 2006-2007 was a lead generator of projects. What, what 10 counties? 10 counties. LaGrange and Steuben on the north side, all the way down to Wabash, Huntington, Wells, and Adams County. So you count the nine corners and add uh, Wabash in. Those 10 counties uh, work together collaboratively. Mark is one of 10 new economic developers in the region. Since we started the partnership, not by design, but as a consequence of the world changing, every single economic developer in the region today is different or new to the region than they were in 2005 or 2006 when we were starting. And that turned out, we talked about these cultural differences, the culture of Mark and his peers in the region has been a very positive thing because they believe in collaboration. And I will give you some specific examples to show you how you do that. But they meet every month. They talk more often. Um, in 2006, we got them all together, and we explained to them our mission of starting up a regional partnership and tried to convince them, right, that we built this collaboration, life would be better for economic development. And there were a lot of non-believers, skeptics in the room, and I would say it was icy cold. They were, you know, they, they treat each other with professional courtesy, but in those days, Mark, you can maybe speak to this better than I can, but our experience was with the equity developers in that day was that they did not want to work together. They were representing solely the interests of their community. And the idea of sharing information, working together on projects was not something that was in their tool set. So, other thoughts or questions so far? Narrow deal. Find project leads. How am I doing on time? Is it late yet? We've got about 20 minutes. 20 minutes? Holy cow. I can, I can shoot. We've covered a little bit 20 minutes. <laughs> um, <Ranging first. coughs> so, um, project leads. And we started building trust around operating a marketing organization for project leads. When we get a lead, for example, we published two this week, all counties know about that project lead at the same time. There's a great deal of concern in the beginning, talking about collaboration and trust, that, for example, Allen County would cherry pick all the very best project leads and they would all stay here in the largest county. Lots of concern around that. So we had to build a system that had lots of transparency. Um, we had to build trust. You know, there's always roadblock uh, potholes along the way, but we had to build trust around the ability to, to find project leads and publish them. <coughs> The other thing that we discovered, though, we were finding these project leads and we published them. Some interesting characteristics with these project leads. Um, as you might imagine, about 60 to 80 percent of those leads, any day of the week, month, or year, about 60 to 80 percent of them are looking for an existing building. So you imagine if you were starting up your company, you would be probably looking for a low-cost way to do that. And most companies don't look to expand their corporation or to start new by building an expensive piece of infrastructure, right? So we were finding project leads, and it turns out in our region, while we have a lot of vacant space, a lot of that vacant space was not necessarily to the standards 
that new corporations were looking for in their existing buildings. The most common impediment is uh, ceiling height. Um, so think of distribution centers today that have very high, clear ceilings for the operation of distribution equipment. Again, the world changed, right? We now have handling equipment that can handle stuff at 40, 45 feet. And that's pretty common. If you've been out to Sweetwater and looked in the windows at their distribution center there, it's, it must be 40 feet, at least 40 feet clear. That kind of building does not exist in our marketplace. So not every project is looking for that, but even 20, 25, 28 with a, with a crane or rail access, all of those were impediments to us closing a deal. And it started, the frustration level with project leads started to grow. People wanted to know, well, we want to win deals. We don't just want project leads. Okay? I mean, at the end of the day, it's about winning projects. To change the shape of this curve, which finally became under clear focus, was that was the reason why people wanted the partnership to work collaboratively in the region. So they wanted to change the shape of the curve. They didn't want per capita income to continue to go down. And you got to win deals to do that, right? Um, the Lido's have been very effective in this, these two pieces in terms of retaining and expanding, and they also do some attraction. We don't try to stop them from doing attraction work. We try to complement their work. But retaining and expanding is the, the momentum for a company to stay. You know, the decision for you to pick up and leave a community is a pretty big decision. And I'll use an example not Indiana-based. Think of Illinois. Everybody's read about what's going on in Illinois, California, Michigan. Bad climates for operating business. And you would think that they would be just rushing to leave Illinois to come to a state that now has national recognition for being a positive business climate, which is Indiana. That is a big decision for a company to pull up roots and come from Illinois to Indiana. You've got to make a pretty good sized business case for that. Some are doing it, but it's a big decision. Uh, what we hope to benefit from is if they choose to expand, they'll consider and they'll give us a chance to be the location where they expand to, not very far from Illinois. And if they expand and add new capital investment or new employees, they would do it in our region. And that's what the partnership is supposed to be, is the conduit to allow people to contact, find us in the world. We do national and international marketing. When we go to China, we actually try to convince, we try to tell the story about where Indiana is, let alone where Huntington or Allen County is. We try to get them to know what Indiana is in the Midwest and what it represents in terms of geographic location access to markets. If we start with Indiana and build a relationship around that, then they're willing to build trust and talk to us about coming here to our region. So thoughts or questions so far? But the idea at the end of the day though was to win projects, right? Win projects. And that's where we started framing a conversation around building the capacity inside the region to win projects. And now I'm coming full circle to where we started this conversation, which comes back to what is it you need to sell this region? What, what is it that you need as business owners to sell this as a region where you want more businesses, more transactions, more capital investment, more employees, more residents, people willing to move here, right? They want to pick up from Chicago and come to Fort Wayne, of all places, because this is a vibrant and healthy place to live. What kinds of things are on your list? What do you want? If, if this is what you want. If we can meet your needs, that's what we sell to the world. And I will, I will add now. Okay, so project leads, and then I talked about capacity building. And there are two pieces to this that we talk about. One is product. Now this is economic development product. What do we represent on a global basis to bring people? Why would they want to do work in Northeast Indiana compared to China? Product. What is that? Talked about it already. Why, how can I convince a Chinese firm or a Japanese firm or a Swedish firm or a German firm, how do I convince them that this is a place for them? 
Skilled labor. We Skilled labor. Yep. <clears throat> Talent. Okay. We have no discussion. In, in job labor, sir. Sorry? In job labor. Job labor, right. Okay. This town, and I'm left handed, okay? My mom, I got it from my mom. Okay, but this is the way left handers write on whiteboards. It's pretty bad. This is talent, okay? That's the lead argument on a global scale. Some of you are doing work on a national level, right? You're in a global marketplace. Somebody in the world can supply the same product. The, the web designers, right? Don't you compete with this all the time? You, you have people someplace on the internet, someplace in the world that can complete, compete with providing the same services. At the end of the day, you have to be able to provide that service at a rate and a quality level that is competitive on a global scale, right? That is the argument to coming to Northeast Indiana. So, on a scale of NEI, we want them to come to Northeast Indiana to increase business transactions, residents, more people commuting around, um, spending money wearing out transmissions, Coming to Russ Moore, you know, every once in a while, not too often, right? They get upset if they do. Yeah, they get very upset if they come in too often. We want that. That's what we want. And the lead argument is that we can do it at a competitive rate. If we don't have the talent required, the basic capability of doing this work, there's no discussion. What do you think about all this? I mean, that's, that's the conundrum, though. I mean, if our revenue, if our this number is really going down steadily, everybody's going to leave. So I mean, that's a circle. Yeah. So how far? Okay. Uh, you can see written right on here. When will we have a sense of urgency? When will we have a sense of urgency? How far does this curve go down before you cannot recover? And when we live in a community, I, I will. I met with a not-for-profit yesterday, and they're getting ready. This, this is all going to be nondescript because it's like super confidential, I guess. But I met with a not-for-profit that's going to be building a really nice structure and adding on so they can add more services and programs. Um, it's really cool what they're getting ready to do. They raised the money to do that project, millions of dollars, in two months. So I have every reason to believe that the resource and the capacity to do something different in this region, it exists in some form or shape or way in this region. It's not about the lack of resources. It's not about the lack of capacity. We're simply positioned that this is a reflection of leadership. And if we don't transform some basic things that we're doing in the region, we don't know how you turn this around. This, this I cannot go to Mark. I'm, I'm the commissioner of Tom Wall. Huntington County, and I'm going to meet with Mark Wickersham this afternoon. We lay this curve on the table in front of Mark Wickersham and say, Mark, you got to stop that. We hired you to stop that. So what are you going to say, Mark? <clears throat> At that point, I'm going to pick up a phone and call the unions and say, we need unions at every plant because we need wages to be more expensive. <laughs> that will drive us. I mean, that's not, I mean, John's working on a transformational process. The Lido's are, in essence, um, the first responders, if you will, and, and working on the short-term business needs. But if, if the cost of doing business in our region goes up by 4 or 5%, what's that doing to your margins and your opportunity for growth? So on the one hand, we have, in a short-term situation, an advantage that we have low costs of doing business and low labor costs. In a long-term picture, in a transformative way, it's a challenge that that very asset to our short-term market is contributing to the problem that in a long-term vision needs somehow to, to be adjusted. And, uh, John has a, has a tremendously difficult challenge uh, that we're all trying to work through together. I can't think of anyone any, any more talented than very soon to do the job that John has. Just send me the bill. I'll cover it later. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to go down and heavily negative path on this, but as we've been talking about talent, as I talked about the program we do and develop, those that I talk to in, in manufacturing and our type of business, this whole aspect of developing talent, by the time it gets to us, it's almost too late in the process, and we don't see any cohesive focus through any of the groups about developing talent through from 
the school levels all the way on out. As we touched on, we've got an aging population, the baby boomers moving out. That used to be Indiana's um, big talent push 20 years ago that we had a skilled workforce, all we need to do is retrain them to a certain extent. Well, that workforce is aged to the point they don't want to be trained and they do want to retire. Um, and those coming in, there weren't that many in the Generation X, there's quite a void there. And the bigger pool is the Generation Y, and they are not ready for what we need. It's going to take a change in our collective will. Um, it's not something that's totally unknown. It's something that we did really great. 40 years ago, and we're going to have to change our philosophy so that we can refocus on creating jobs, not necessarily, and this is going to sound bad, at the highest end of the income pool, but we have to create jobs first, be competitive, and then we can look at raising salaries. I mean, one of the things that I'm frustrated with is the current educational institutions are teaching kids that come out of uh, college with four-year degrees that it's a cakewalk. And I'm telling you that that's not the case. I mean, they need a serious reality check. And they need to be thinking like your generation was thinking. And your previous generation before that, I have to go and do what I need to do to make a living. Um, not everyone is going to be a white collared, high paid uh, college grad. I mean, there's nothing wrong with blue collar jobs. There's nothing wrong with it. There's a stigma associated I'll, with that. I'll, I will, I mean, I'll just for a minute, the, you know, the conversations I have with Generation Y, who may be 22, 23 years old, if you've gone through the vocational training and stuff that we can do, that we need, whether it's my business or any of the other manufacturing schools or like that, you know, my guys at that age can have a full benefits package and be making forty to $50,000 a year. I, I do consulting with Nick, and I see what he's doing as an organization, and I see the kids that are coming out. I put the people into jobs in jobs in more skilled labor positions, and I'll tell you, there's people in droves graduating from college that are working for a lot less after they come in terms in touch with reality than the people that Nick's got working for him. Now that's just a fact. But do the kids know this? Is is it being taught from the family structure? Is it being taught from the educational structure? Is it being pushed from the political perspective? No, it's not. And we have to change that focus. If we can center the conversation back around manufacturing and the creation of jobs in the manufacturing sector. And we can be competitive. I mean, I get calls every day from India, Pakistan, and China with people telling me that I could do you know, I can outsource my labor force, my 32 people on staff, for one-tenth of what it costs me to do it here. And, you know, I just smile and set the phone down on them because I'm trying to do something here to create jobs. And that mentality has got to change. We have to drive that in. We as a collective community have to do that. And that's the theme here about collaboration. And I would simply offer that if we as a region don't figure out, we've, we've chosen this Vision 2020 thing as merely a way to get regional leadership around the idea that there's some fundamental things that need to be changed as a region. And if we don't think differently, we're not going to change the shape of the curve. And that, in my view, back all the way back to 2006 when they started the partnership, we we're very focused, project leads, project leads. But if we weren't winning projects, that's not very satisfying. Right. It should not be satisfied in this region. How many of you would be willing, would you pay anything more if you could get students out of Ivy Tech with a certain skill level or mindset? They work together, they problem solve, they could communicate, they work together in teams. Would and you do. pay anything more to get that out of the, I mean, the money I talked about is, 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 is the top of the scale for the guys that, that had the aptitude and attitude and started with it and retained it. Um, but they didn't come to me with the skill set, and so they didn't start that way. Right. I have to put the skill set in. The manufacturer that I had lunch with on Monday, um, he was much more pessimistic than you were. He was saying roughly the same thing, but he said this is a, this is a generation of workforce. He said it goes all the way back to the family. He says most of the people I talk to 
don't want to work in factories. They don't get what manufacturing is today. Oh, that's exactly right. Yeah. They don't get it. So, I mean, there are cultural issues, again, fundamental to this problem. I mean, this is not a, a warm, you know, this collaboration, that's warm artwork. You put a blanket around that, sit down and you collaborate with your wife and watch TV, right? But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about doing some hard, <coughs> transfer, transformational things in this region's economy. We're using Vision 20 to do this. And at the same time we're doing this, Mark needs project leads now. This year, this, I'm going I'm to try to build an up, up point here. This, lead, this year, this region has more project leads halfway through the year than they had all of last year. Now, I will, I will give credit to the economy. There's people, more people doing work this year than last year, all right? So I'm old. But we now have in place the infrastructure. We're starting to get the name recognition as a region that we have our collective act together. When a site selector comes to us, we're having, we're having one visit on Monday and Tuesday of next week. We're, we're trying to get them to see us in the very best light. We don't want them to talk about GE leaving town or International Harvester or Navistar. All that stuff is a part of the past now. You all, the work that you're doing day in and day out, you are the reputation that we're trying to build in people's minds today about being able to do work on a global scale at a competitive rate. And you can do this here in Northeast Indiana at a much more competitive rate than you can in Chicago, Indianapolis, Dayton, and all these other places. You can do that here and have a good quality of life. You don't have to drive 10 or 15 minutes to work, not an hour and a half on a train or something like that. I mean, there's some, there's some real attributes about doing work in this region that exists no place else in the world if we can figure out how to crack this nut. I don't think you get there without doing more like he's professor. The fact of the matter is, is that there is not only a <coughs> cultural change, a generational change, and you have a culture now that wants it now versus waiting. Right. That's that's a, a big stumbling block. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. Whoops. We'll wander back down the road for a minute again, but to Mark and I take out of the same hill and to a certain extent, this aspect of what's gone on with the baby boomers leaving the, the workforce and generation, I face that in my own business and stuff. The home education that's gone on for the generation Y coming in behind fits very much what you're talking about. Um, you know, the, the stigmas and stuff to, to people to take a job in my business versus parents who want them to go off to the college and take a four-year degree and finally end up taking a management training course at McDonald's because that's all they can get. Uh, it, it's, I mean, for me, it's day in and day out right. when I'm hiring. When I'm hiring. Right. I, these, these, are really good, these are really good points. Um, I would just highlight for you, um, this is our annual report from last year, and I would encourage you to take this away, maybe breeze through it. If you have it. Before you throw it away, Breeze through it. This is actually some good flow that's working here. It's really good materials. I mean, take a good look at that. Yeah, but if you look at page 11, look at page 11, a lot of this stuff comes off the website that Sears did for us. But page 11 talks about the talent initiative. This region won $20 million from the Lilly Endowment out in Indianapolis for an economic development project, which was the talent initiative. So $20 million. $5 million went into this facility right behind us, the Keith Bussey Advanced Manufacturing Center. We bought stuff for them so they can train people to do manufacturing work in this region. They had a building without state-of-the-art equipment. Okay, $20 million of that money went into that. I mean, $5 million went into there. $5 million went to Ivy Tech. Um, that was the $5 million for Ivy Tech. We put $5 million into work, work and retraining. We put $5 million into um, uh, starting new tech high schools, talking about cultural, this is K through 12. We had the hardest time convincing the Lilly Endowment that we could spend $5 million in K through 12 that would be productively engaged. They said, we've, we've taken a dive into K through 12. K, K through 12 is, has a lot of challenges to change. And so what we didn't do is we didn't try to change the system. We offered another tool. Huntington, as it turns out, was one of the lead schools to adopt a new tech high school in its project-based learning. Mm -hmm. They teach everything through projects. It's, 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 I mean, if you get a chance to tour one, it is amazing what they're doing. And we're not trying to change the curriculum or what they're being taught 
so much as how to be part of it. If we had New Tech High Schools, I would love to have my son in one. It would have been an entirely different experience than sitting in a classroom listening to lectures. So it's cultural, some big challenges. And I would just say that this, we don't do all this work at the partnership, but we are the convener of the conversation, the collaborative, the people that brings people together. We, we're, not, we're not educators. We try to bring them around the table and help them understand in these areas how that affects our ability to do economic development and win projects. The reputation we're trying to create on your behalf is that we can do this work at a competitive rate and be globally competitive. So do really high quality stuff. Um, the other thing that we do, and we kept saying, going back to this collaboration theme, this kind of thinking, leadership thinking, is not something we practice. We've been doing 10 counties, 10 communities, cities, counties. We've been doing that on an isolated basis in the silos for many years. We're simply getting people to talk to one another that they have common problems. I came from uh, Kosciuszko this morning and I was talking to a business manufacturer in Kosciuszko. Same conversation. Why Warsaw and Kosciuszko were not participating together on this and they want to do a new tech high school. We now have six of them in this region. Why we wouldn't partner on that? We have nothing to take from Warsaw. We want Warsaw to be totally successful. Many of them live here. They bring their children here for schools. All that kind of stuff. But this, this region would not be what it is today if they plucked Warsaw out and took it to some other major metro area. We'd be losers on that. So getting leaders to think differently about the opportunities for partnerships and collaboration. I will show you, um, and if you go to the centerfold, there are uh, a beautiful picture on the centerfold of a project. That's a nine. You all thought I was going to something else with that. Yes. Project Iatron. Project Iatron. This, in my mind, is a great example. This occurred in 2010. This company is a Canadian firm. They came here because we had a gap in the supply chain network to Warsaw. They were a client, a supplier already to, to uh, Zimmer. And in all intents and purposes, they should have been in Kosciuszko. But they came to Northeast Indiana because of the opportunities that exist in this region, our knowledge of the, of the industries, what we're doing to help medical device firms succeed in manufacturing, and because of the collaborative nature of our work. And Mark, again, knows this well. If the Lido's at a local level had not collaborated to give stimulus bonding authority back to the state, which was reallocated to Whitley County, we probably would not have won this project. But it happened as a direct result of the communities being able to work together, trust one another, and understand that a project in this region, wherever they locate, it doesn't matter about it does. I know it does, Mark. I know it does. It, it matters where these projects go. But if they end up in the region, when Mark opened Onward Manufacturing in an existing facility in 2009, 2009, they were buying steel from Steel Dynamics the very first day. Okay, so the region, at the end of the day, people were back to work at a very difficult time because he was buying steel from Onward Manufacturing in Huntington. That's all we're trying to say is that this is a different world People can collaborate, talk to one another in a way that they've never done before, and it matters to our economy. This is what people want to change in the region, and the partnership is a vehicle to do that. We are not, we don't have all the answers, we don't have an agenda. We have a reason to bring people together because we think it matters to you. I just want to keep bringing this back to you. Your ability as a small and medium-sized company to do work in this region is dependent on changing the shape of this curve. And I just say that we're all personally invested in changing this. That's what I'm passionate about. I have, I have friends in my church that are not working. You know, and I, and I, I'm actually, it makes me both sad and glad to see them every week because I know they're not working. I'm personally invested in trying to change that situation for them. I think it matters to people personally. They, they sit around the kitchen tables and make decisions about where the kids go to school, whether they go out to eat at night, where they go on vacation. Those are very personal things. And if you all cannot be successful putting people back to work, this, this work is, uh, is of no, no effect. So I, I hope, and I'm probably done by now, right? I'm over, and uh, Derek will be getting uncomfortable if I don't stop soon. 
when he said we had wiggle room. Does any of this, are there any questions or comments or thoughts about this? This is what the regional partnership has become. We didn't start here, but we came here because of realization that we had to win projects for us to be a value-added organization to the region. Thoughts or questions? I'd just like to add a comment. Um, if I had to put that, that proposition together for the partnership, I would say you guys are a champion for the kind of change you need to take place. So you're communicating that out to the people, the political folks, uh, industry. Industry has to realize that we're all independent. Um, you know, the successes of, of each organization uh, impacts the community as a whole. We all feed off of that. So that's what we need to be focused on and realize that we can do this. We just need to act. We are funded from private sources. Our, some of our investors on the back page here, we have, uh, turns out we went through investment campaigns. So we have lots of investors that we had uh, last year, but we're 80% funded from private and foundation sources. We, the public side was very concerned that they would end up carrying the burden of the partnership's work on a regional level. And so it was very important for us to keep the public burden low and not increase the burden on the public side. So they're about Right now, I think they're actually about 17% of our funding comes from public sources. And we try to make sure that the, the private side is carrying the burden and leading the business development activity. So, thank you very much, Mark. And Matt, thanks for the opportunity. Sir, um, you talked about the uh, suppliers available to people. Have you actively gone out to, to develop a range of suppliers for potential needs? Um, what we do, we have uh, we have target industries. We did an analysis of the kinds of companies doing work in the region, and the purpose of that was to be able to focus our marketing efforts around companies that had the opportunity for growth and were core strengths. In other words, keep in mind, okay, if we keep coming back to this talent thing, what we sell on a global scale, we say advanced manufacturing, but that's not very specific. What is it you make? Well, we do a lot of automotive work, we do medical devices, you look at the defense firms, they're doing wireless communications and so forth. We've got six target industries. Those six are, and uh, I'll stumble on this, right? I've done this a hundred times. Advanced manufacturing, transportation logistics, defense, defense and aerospace, medical devices, food processing. Is that six? Distribution, Distribution, logistics, food processing, advanced manufacturing, medical devices, and I did leave one out. Specialty insurance. Uh -huh. This region has a unique skill set right. for insurance firms. If you look at Brotherhood Mutual, American Specialties in Huntington, um, Swiss Re, uh, Highland, K and K. Okay, it's a long list, all spun off from Lincoln leaving, and they are Brotherhood Mutual is another one. They are doing some tremendous national, international work right here because of talent. They are here. I've asked Swiss Re, if I could meet with them this afternoon, well, why are you still here? Well, it would have been more cost effective to go elsewhere, but they didn't have the talent. The people doing the work were already here, and they liked the nature of their work. So we have those six areas that we focus our efforts on, and looking at their core strengths. We do what we call industry cluster analysis. We pull them together. We talk to them about their needs. We're, in fact, we're talking to insurance companies right now. Guess what their lead issue from an insurance company standpoint is? This is not a trick question. Actuarial talent? Actuarial talent. Exactly. They want to develop programs here that will produce this pipeline of students, young people, okay, to replace with the next generation. Okay. That's what we're trying to do to focus these efforts. <coughs> convince other companies to start insurance firms here. Really appreciate your time. You've been very patient. Um, and I appreciate your involvement. It, like this is this is grueling. If nobody says anything to you, this is like <laughs> so, yeah, thank you so much. And if there's ever any questions or work that I can do on your behalf, I get asked to do short versions of this. If that would be ever helpful to your company, your board, your group, whatever you'd like to do, I'd be happy to do that. So, do you have a Facebook page? Me? The partnership does have a Facebook page. I didn't find it. Um, I'll check on that. We're actually... <laughs> I have your website up, but I don't have... We're
doing a revision to our website where this <laughs> transition period seems. Well, I'm serious about our website as well. I'm, I'm thinking, anybody type that closely to Sarah's and not have your Facebook page is just wrong. Yes, it's just, it is just wrong. It is just wrong. And they do, so I'm just in the interregional partnership. Uh, Facebook.com slash pages slash Northeast Indiana dash Northeast dash Indiana dash regional dash partnership. Okay. Anything else? Thank you so much. Appreciate your time. Thank you. And just I'll get a big free agent that will really impact your team. But I think that um, if you look around, one of the keys to growing economically and increasing that line is going to be as we as businesses start to look at the things that Steve was talking about earlier, how can we innovate and come up with the next big idea and draw money from around the country and around the globe into our region? Look at companies like uh, Sweetwater Sound, all right? They could have just been a little local shop on the corner, but they had a vision for creating something and going out and marketing their business and drawing in millions of dollars into our community and creating jobs because they took ideas, they were innovative, they said, ask the questions that Steve talked about today. What is going to wow the marketplace and set in motion the capability to do that? You know, and if we can develop that mentality here and the regional partnership and others that are out there trying to lay the infrastructure for us to be able to do that, I mean, it's great. I don't get water furnace who Tim Linton's going to speak today a little bit, but what they're doing, I mean, they've developed, and it's been years ago, but they developed an innovative solution where they tap the geothermal energy of the earth to lower your heating bill. And a lot of people said, wow, that's great, we want that. And then they went out and they built a distribution network across the country and across the globe to sell that product effectively and bring money back here and grow jobs. And that's really what it's about. I mean, we can rely on and we need to be marketing ourselves to other people trying to get them to come here. But we also, I think, have to, <laughs> to innovate, market ourselves. I mean, it's product starts with product innovation. And then what we're going to talk about in the second half of today is how can you effectively take those ideas and market them out there using today's technology, which, by the way, is way more cost effective and can get you out in front of millions of people more cost effectively than ever before. If you have something good to sell and to say, now you can market yourself as a company and a business and bring those dollars in here and grow jobs. And that's how jobs grow. I know my organization, as we've, you know, John was saying, you know, you got to compete. We can't compete dollar for dollar anymore on just doing web work because you can take that to India or wherever. So we've developed technology that now we can give to people that meets their need at a lower price and helps them be more efficient. But if we can get people around the country buying into that, then we hire more people here. We can pay higher wages. We can. We've had no problem drawing talent in the Northeast Indiana when we have the way competitive wage to offer them, and we have the need because we have revenue coming in uh, from around the country and around the globe to feed, you know, the beast, so to speak. And that starts with innovation. One last point <laughs> to this: to what yeah. Matt just said. Test question. And Mark, you know the answer to this, so you can answer. Hmm. Okay. Over the last year. All, given all that we've talked about today, over the last year, the state has created thousands of jobs in the state. What percent of those jobs, as a result of this work together, the collaborative work that we're doing as a region, what percent were created in the 10 counties of Northeast Indiana? What's your guess? We are 10% we are of the population base. 10%. What's your guess? How many of the jobs, not, not number, but percent, of the, it's like 20 some thousand job commitments over the last year, 12 months, how many, what percent was created here in Northeast Indiana? 30. 30%? I think higher, 75. Sorry, I think a lot. 75%. 75%. Other guesses? 80%. 80%? That's incredible. You guys are. This is the it's, it's actually 30%. First guess was right. 30% of the jobs created in the state were created inside this region, not because of attraction projects, but because of consolidation projects, uh, retention projects, expansion projects. 30% of those created in the state were in this region. So I'm very optimistic that we can do this work if we're willing to collaborate.